five and, and beyond. Um, I'm going to save chapter three, which is the globalization chapter, and I want to talk to you about this on Monday um, or in, cla in the classroom. Um, but what I want to do now is start on chapter four, where we begin the section of this school of business or this uh, intro to business course, uh, where we talk about how you manage, how you start a business, run a business, manage a business, how it's sort of like the micro view of being inside of an organization and getting it started and moving forward and creating something. It's the, um, the management perspective on organizations, business, economic enterprises, companies, that sort of thing. Um, that's what we'll start with, with a couple of chapters or a couple of, uh, of, of sessions and focus on what it's like to be inside of an organization and, um, and how you succeed in that scenario. Um, and by the way, I'd be happy to answer any questions from a career perspective, what it's like in organizations. I worked in organizations for 25 years um, in various roles from being an individual contributor all the way up to being a vice president of, uh, of a multinational company um, in R&D as well as in system development, as well as in finance, as well as in business development, various kinds of roles. Um, never had a sales role or marketing role, but had uh, many others with people reporting to me, not reporting to me. I had this work project teams, all these various types of roles that um, we can talk about if you want to explore those in more detail and what it's like and how you succeed in those kinds of situations. Um, but today, we're going to just start from the beginning. Uh, I want, I'm thinking of covering two chapters, either today or in the today and then continuing on. It's sort of like the baseline for how you organize a business we'll start with, and then we'll talk about small business and entrepreneurship, okay? Um, and that's one of the things that's dear to my heart, entrepreneurship. That's the course I teach uh, in, at the junior and senior level uh, here at Adelphi, as well as this intro course. It's about how you take an idea and grow a business and potentially change the way people work and think and act and behave and also potentially make a lot of money in the markets. Um, but we'll talk about the beginnings of that um, after we get into how you actually organize and what you do when you organize a business. There's a several different things to think about when you look at various kinds of organizations. The one we most often think about, um, and when you look at uh, the S&P 500 companies that you know about, that you hear about on TV and the radio, like Delta Airlines, um, Virgin Atlantic Airlines, um, I was thinking about airlines because those were in the news this morning because of all the weather cancellations, but gasoline companies and B British Petroleum, the company that spilled oil in the Gulf of Mexico, but you also see them with their green stars and uh, sunrise things, and uh, Exxon, Apple, uh, Dell, all of these are corporations. And the, the thing about corporations is that if you form a business as a corporation, the corporation becomes an entity in and of itself. In fact, sometimes people even go so far as to say it's a person. It has rights, if you will. That was one of the things that was in the last presidential campaign with Mitt Romney. He famously said that corporations are persons. Well, they're not persons per se, but what he was really saying is that they are um, they're entities that have, that have standing legally. You can sue them and they can sue you, right, the corporations. But what's useful about them also is that they, these things that are listed here, they have a limited liability component to them. So if you want to start a, uh, a business that does construction on people's homes and you hire a lot of people, and one of the problems that happens when you're working on a house is you have somebody that doesn't know what they're doing very well and they cause some damage in the home. They break the heating system or something like that. Well, the homeowner can sue against you because you've basically wrecked their house. Who do they sue? That's the question, right? Um, if you're a sole proprietorship, which we'll talk about later, or you're just running the business on your own, they sue you personally. And because they sue you personally, your home, all of your assets, you know, the money you've put away for your kids to go to college, the money you've saved, all of that, your house, uh, your car, anything else you have, any art might work you might have or anything you inherited or whatever, 
can actually be subject to the lawsuit. In fact, your wages could be garnished so that your future earnings when you work could also potentially be paid to, to support somebody who has had this problem. So if you go in and start a company and do something that causes damage, you personally are liable if you do not put some intermediary entity between you and that risk. And that's what corporations are designed to do. You start a corporation, they limit the liability of the people that own it. The corporation is liable. What that means is the same scenario, the homeowner sues your company. Well, maybe your corporation, your, cor your company is a corporation, which means that it's registered as a corporation, you pay certain fees, you do certain things, and all of the risk is limited to what's in the corporation. All of the assets of the corporation, the corporation might lose its trucks and its bank accounts and all of that to the homeowner, but your personal stuff is protected because you're simply an owner of this corporation or you're a manager within this corporation. The corporation is what's liable. So that's what's meant by limited liability. It insulates individuals from the risks associated with doing damage in a commercial environment and being sued in the courts associated with that. Now, there is a gross negligence issue that can cross, the, they can pierce the corporation umbrella. If a manager, if like when you're doing such a thing and uh, you're at the house and you just decide for some reason to willfully or whatever to do something that is uh, grossly negligent or purposeful, like you smash their furnace, um, you can technically be, the corporation is sued, but you can also pass through that and get to the individual because of some gross negligence and whatever. So you still have to act in a responsible manner as a manager and an owner, but if you're acting in a responsible manager, a responsible manager as an owner or manager, then something that happens with your company uh, is the limit, the, the risk associated with down, with negative consequences of that activity is, um, is limited to the corporation. If you're driving a company car and you have a terrible accident and you hurt some people or damage some property, the corporation is liable for that activity. The corporation has the insurance and all of that, right, because you're operating as part of the corporation. So that's what this limited liability thing means, and it's very important, particularly for large companies, or particularly when you're taking risks. The other thing that corporations can do for you is you can transfer ownership. You can start a company, and then you can sell it. And you do that by selling the shares of the corporation. If you start a sole proprietorship, it's a little more complicated. You can't really sell the business. You have to sell the assets. You still can do it. But the entity itself is actually not sold. What's sold is all the pieces of it, and you could sell the name and all of that, but someone else reconstitutes it. If it's a corporation, it's sold. You start a company, say it's the same one, it does uh, homeowner construction and, and repairs and the like, and it's a corporation. Uh, you could decide one day that the next door neighbor wants to buy your company. He starts going in and working at that place, and you stay home, and that's as simple as that. It's been sold. The same company, same employees, all the contracts are in place, and all of that. So you can see that there's advantages on this transfer of ownership. Related to that is this notion that you also have a, a corporation continues to go on forever. Uh, like because you can sell it or whatever, um, if you all of a sudden die or retire, it just continues with whoever bought it from you and take it forward or it can pass on to your, uh, to your heirs. They take it over and start running it. Uh, it goes on until it's dissolved. Right? This isn't the case of the sole proprietorship. If you're running a pizza parlor or whatever and you die, um, it's over. Right now, you can pass along the assets and all of that, but someone else, the same kind of thing. All the contracts have to be renegotiated and everything. But if it's a corporation, no, it just keeps going. Very good, um, uh, very good, uh, uh, it, very many advantages associated with a corporation. Um, you can also and, and get an, an investor to come in and buy part ownership by selling some shares of the company. You can expand by, you know, merging with other corporations. And essentially, you've created something that you then push out into the world like a baby.
and it goes off and does its own thing and grows and becomes important and successful and all that. You're working there, you're owning it and all that, but it's really an entity in and of itself, which is what's different than a sole proprietorship, which is yourself running the business. All right, so it's quite different. Now, there are disadvantages, and I'll get to the double taxation one in a minute, because it's the, the hardest one to figure out. But there is this uh, idea in a, a corporation of separating the owner from the employer. Um, most of the time, or many times, in small businesses that are also corporations, the owner is the manager. So it is in, basically runs the place and owns it. So it has two different roles. I don't necessarily think this is so much of a disadvantage, but it does tend to confuse one's thinking. Am I thinking about this as a owner or a manager? And how do I get my profits as an owner or a manager and all that sort of thing? But that, it does create that separation. So now you have employees that are looking out for themselves, and then you have owners that have to worry about their situation. So this, this thing that's called in the business the agency issue, because employers, employees work as agents of a corporation, but they also have their own interests at heart because they don't really have the ownership stake. So they may, there may be this conflict of interest that we talked about before. When you're working for a company and somebody gives tickets to you to a Rangers game, like we were saying, because of your role in the company, if you think about it, those tickets are really being given to the company, not to you. Because of the reason that, they're, that you have this relationship is in your role as an agent acting for the company. And so that creates this conflict of interest situation as well. Um, you also have to have costs associated with being a corporation. You, uh, you have to disclose certain information every quarter. There's a quarterly disclosures. Uh, if it's a smaller corporation, it's annual. You have to disclose your financials, and you have to disclose contracts. And there's forms and things that you have to fill out. Uh, again, like forming the corporation. You have bylaws. You have to have meetings, annual meetings and the like. There are certain things that you have to do that provide overhead associated with being a corporation. And that's an also a negative. The one that's most, and, and it does have those costs associated with that. If you're a big company, and you're a big private company that's been run, you know, like say it's a billion dollar company, but it's private, and it decides to be go public. But it's a large company like that, and it's going to be public and, and traded on the exchanges and things like that. There are costs associated with being public, a public corporation, um, additional disclosures. The people say somewhere around a million dollars a year of extra costs associated with being a public corporation. Private corporations still have costs, but it's not quite that high. But just to give you an idea that to have these protections and these uh, different opportunities, there are some costs associated with that, and that's the corporation. Um, the last one that people talk about probably the most in forming corporations in this idea is this double taxation. And this is what that, how many of you have heard of the term double taxation when it relates to corporations? Double taxation. Anybody hear that term? Raise your hand. Uh, maybe a couple people have heard of double taxation. What that means is that there's a tax, a corporation is an entity, right? So corporations have a tax rate. If you're a corporation and you make profit or you make money, just like if you make income, on income tax, and you're an individual working, you have to pay taxes as that, as that entity. So the corporation pays taxes. There's, a, there's various rates for that. There's state taxes, local taxes, federal taxes. Somewhere in the 35, 39% range total taxes that you pay for the, to the federal government, to the state government, to local governments, uh, somewhere in there is an assumption that you would make. So if you make $100 in profit before taxes, you would have to pay, let's just say for, um, for uh, argument's sake, 40% of that. It's, that's higher than you probably would end up paying. But let's just say you have to pay, if you make $100, you have to pay $40 to these various and tax, them, uh, tax entities. But then remember, that money is the corporation's money. You still have to take that corporation's money and give it to the owners, right? Because the, the money was made by this other entity that you've created and pushed off and, and you know, it's grown on its own and it's made $100 and now it has paid $40 to the government. Then it has $60 left that it wants to give, potentially give it to the owners. And when the owners get it, how can they get it? How do you get it? Any ideas? Anybody have an idea of how you get money out of a company? Well, one, 
company you could do is you could get it as an employee. That is, you give yourself a bonus. If you're a small company and you're running it and you're the president of it, you can give yourself a bonus. Any other way? I mean, that's you can't do that on a big company, though. Okay, we just I, I see some people typing, but not necessarily answering this question. So, the answer is you give a dividend. What that means is that you go and your board of directors votes as a corporation, and the corporation decides that it's going to give all of its shareholders a certain amount of money out of that sixty dollars. Uh, $60. If there's only one shareholder, the board is only one person that owns the corporation. The board decides to give that sixty dollars to the owner. So the owner gets a dividend payment, and those dividend payments are taxed, subject to capital taxes. If it's in the same year, it's short term, it's subject to the same kind of tax rate as you get as income. If it's long term, in other words, it's been in the company for a while, for a number of years, then it's subject to a lower tax rate, 15 to 20 percent. It's changing. Okay? But notice that the, it was, the money was taxed when it came into the company, when it made the money, and it's being taxed when it's being given to shareholders. So that's the double taxation notion that you get from corporations. Okay? So as you can see, the the invention of the corporation has real benefits, and it's one of the things that really, excuse me, really caused um, business to take off, capitalism. Because you create these separate entities that can go do things, you can buy and sell them. The person that starts them can sell them to somebody else. Different people have different skills. They go on forever, you know, like hundreds of years for companies like Nokia um, and other sorts of uh, firms that have been around for years. U.S. firms 100 years for General Motors and AT&T 150 years. Uh, they can go on forever, really, until they screw up, right? And they have all these advantages. There's costs associated with them. One of them is that since they are separate entities, they get their own money and they get to keep their money. And if they want to give that money to someone else, it's a gift, essentially, and that's a dividend. And so the gift that comes with the dividend also is taxed when it comes to individuals. So that's the double taxation issue. Okay, so let's uh, go on and talk about the two types of stocks that are involved in a corporation. By the way, I'll come back and mention the fact that you can get around the double taxation issue in a couple of ways. One of them is called an S corp. Another one is a different structure entirely, and we'll talk about that also in a couple of minutes. But stock ownership, that's the ownership aspect of it. Once you set up a company who owns it, there's two types. One is called preferred stock. And the other is called common stock. Start with common stock. That's essentially if you just divide up the ownership into shares, everybody is the same. It's the one that commonly is distributed. That's the stock that you get. There's nothing unusual about it, and it is the one that um, is sort of the baseline for share ownership. There's no dividend, nothing like that. What happens is that when you're an owner, you have rights, usually voting rights as well. Um, but if you come in and the board says we're going to give ownership, they give out an equal amount, all the common share stockholders get, according to the number of shares they have, they get dividends, right? When it, every year there's a, pro, there's a meeting, an annual meeting, there's a vote, common stock, usually it's described as one vote for common share. If you have 100 shares, you get 100 votes. There's a million shares, you get 100 votes out of a million. All the shareholders come together and they vote, and that's how certain types of decisions are made. Preferred stock sits on top of common stock in the sense that it has a preference over common stock. Those preferences can be quite different, although in usual, usually what this means is that they pay some sort of a dividend or an interest payment regardless of the vote. It's predetermined. It doesn't have to be voted on. So you may get a 3% payment every, every quarter or annually from preferred stock that you don't have and that you don't get in common. It's preferred, so the first thing is you have your owners, the money comes in as profit into the corporation, the preferred shareholders get their share, whatever that pre preference is, the 3%, and then what's left, the board might vote a dividend to the common stockholders. So that's how that process works. Preferences can be other things as well. Preferences in voting, it could be two shares per preferred share versus or three, three shares or ten shares or ten votes or whatever per share. So there are other kinds of preferences. But essentially preferred stock has a higher, uh, it sits, 
in, in terms of how creditors are paid and who gets the money out of the corporation, the preferred shareholders have a preferred position, which is why it's called that. If you're going to take the money out, preferred shareholders get first dibs on the money. All right, it's like calling the uh, shotgun seat when you're driving. You get the first call on the shotgun seat. All right, that's the preference idea. Okay, they still use the term shotgun for driving. That's the, that's the passenger side of the front seat. I don't know. Anyway, I used to call it that. Um, nobody's helping me out on that. Okay, that's all right. All right, so that's stock ownership. Other kinds of things that you have is sometimes you have a joint venture where two companies come together. Um, these can be where you actually just have a partnership and you form it, or it actually could be formed as a separate corporation, a separate company, a separate kind of organization. Right? Or groups come together. Um, these aren't all that common. Much more common that you'll hear about is this idea of S corps, S, S corporations. By the way, a normal corporation that we talked about earlier, they call it a C corp, even though it really just means a regular corporation. But people do call that a C corp. So if you ever hear someone say a C corp, that just means a corporation corporation, rather than a subchapter S corporation, which is what we'll talk about here. And the difference between a C corp or a corporation, a regular corporation, and, a, and an S corp is that the S corp, whenever you fill out your forms of incorporation, you make a selection, which is the S, paragraph S selection in the forms, which means you're an S corp. And what that means is that you've, you've selected to have your income treated, the income of the corporation treated as the, uh, as the individual income of the owners. So it flows straight from, and the corporation makes the money, but instead of it staying with the corporation and having to be sent out as a dividend, it flows directly to the owners. Now there's restrictions on that. You can only have so many owners. You can only have so many, um, so many, so many shareholders. You can only have so many employees. It has to be a relatively small corporation. And you can shift from an S corp to a C corp. So it's a good idea sometimes if you start a company and you start as a corporation and you're small, you don't want the double taxation problem. People start as an S corp. And then, and then as they grow, they convert over into a C corp. C corps are the big ones. They're the ones that go public. They're the ones that get sold, that sort of thing. Um, so you start as an S corp, and then as you grow, you turn into a C corp. You cannot, however, go the other direction. Start as a C corp because you think you're going to be the next General Motors. Find out you're not, and then convert into an S corp. It doesn't happen that way. There are things that you can do, an asset sale, one or the other, or whatever, but they're more legally, um, legally complicated. So you want to be thinking about the trend, the pathway that you take um, as one forms a small business and gets going and moving forward. But this gets around, you still have all the other benefits of the corporation. That is, you can have perpetual life, you can sell it, you can raise funds from external investors up to a point, all these various things. You have all that, you have reporting requirements and the like, but you get around that double taxation problem as long as you're small uh, via this, uh, by, by S uh, Corp election. All right? So it's something to keep in mind, and you'll hear people talk about that, and now you understand what that means. And here is the um, a description of it a little bit. There's small, there's only one class of stock. You have to have less than a certain number of shareholders, um, and they have to be U.S. citizens. So you're talking about a smallish company that you want to, um, to, to organize, and you want it to have a, a small base because the money, the, the, the earnings flow directly out to the company, to the shareholders, okay, as income, all right? So that's the subchapter S. Um, the next structure to kind of be aware of is, uh, is a limited liability company. This is the ones we talk about here. This is the newest one. It hasn't been around. Uh, it's been around, I guess, close to 50 years, which seems like a long time. But when you consider the other ones that have been around for 100 years or 150 years or 300 years, um, it's relatively recent. And it was actually set up to solve some of the problems that we have from corporations and S-Corps. The, 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 um, the transition from sole proprietorship to S-Corp is not that easy. You have reporting requirements. You have organi organizing requirements. 
Um, you have all these elections that have to occur. Um, you have to have a board of directors and all these sorts of things. Um, limited liability company is set up to be an ideal transfer, transition company that goes from sole proprietorship through corporations, uh, through the power of corporations, multiple owner, one owner, multiple owners, all that sort of thing. Um, but what is easier doesn't require a lot of uh, filing and forms and all of that as, as other things would. It also has the very important and critical element is that it limits liability. That liability thing we talked about, the very first thing with corporations, LLCs also offer that. So you can start a business as one person, form a limited liability company, and if you're acting as that limited liability company, all that can be sued is the assets that are owned by that company and not you personally. So they can't go after your car and your bank accounts and your wages and all of that if you're formed as a limited liability company. If you're formed as a sole proprietorship, they can. So really, there's not much reason to form a sole proprietorship business in today's economy because of LLCs. You could form one probably for about $500 if you get a legal, if you get legal support it might go up to $1,000, but then you're formed, and if something happens, if you're, um, if you're a painter, a, home, a house painter, and you go out, and based upon uh, you're painting a house, and your can of paint falls down and hits somebody that goes to the hospital, it's a, it's a terrible accident, uh, but it could also totally destroy your life if that person has problems, because you personally are liable for any of the medical bills and all of that if you're a sole proprietor. However, if you're a limited liability company, then you are not personally liable. Your company goes bankrupt. The insurance pays for it, you know, the, whatever insurance you have. Um, but if for some reason that insurance runs out or is underinsured, it's, a, it's unfortunate to the family that, or whoever was hurt but they would have to rely on their own insurance under those situations because your bank, you, your company goes bankrupt and you're, you are a little bit protected. Um, that wasn't a particularly good example because it doesn't quite seem fair to the person that was hurt, but it maybe it's just damage to the house or whatever that cost a hundred thousand dollars or whatever. Your company goes under, but you are not. You are shielded with a limited liability company. So if you want to start a company of any kind and there's any risk of liability, uh, the first thing you want to do is investigate limited liability companies. You can have a single member LLC, which means you file exactly the same tax as you would as an individual or as a sole proprietor. So it has that advantage. You don't have to form a, file a separate tax form. Um, and you can then have additional members, so it becomes a multi-member LLC, in which case you do have to file separate forms, but the good news is you have a multi-member, uh, you have a company that's running and it's limited liability and all, it's like an S-corp and that the taxes flow to all the members. So it could act like a sole proprietorship, it can act like an S-corp, and it can act to a certain degree like a C-corp, although what people will typically do is they'll form a limited liability company as a sole proprietorship, instead of a sole proprietorship, grow to an S-corp-like multi-member LLC, and then they will turn into a corporation whenever they decide to grow and acquire other companies or assets or whatever and, um, and become a, a, a separate entity at that point. Um, you say, why have both? Well, like I said before, the limited liability company was specifically designed to come in and make it easier to make that transition from sole proprietor through S Corp into corporation. And it's very easy to do that. Uh, you cannot go backwards, however. You can go from single member to multi member to C Corp, but you can't go C Corp to multi member and you can't go multi member to single member. So you grow, but you can't really go backwards. But this is definitely something to look into um, if you're forming a business. If there's any, any kind of liability whatsoever. All right? Any questions on that, on these structures? This is a little bit um, legalistic, maybe. Uh, but these are the sorts of things that you'll see as, um, as you look at various kinds of companies. Um, one other one that you'll come across is this idea of a cooperative, which is nothing more than a group of people that come together uh, and form uh, an agreement, uh, an organization that they sort of work together 
um, in different kinds of forms, cooperatives for a, a apartment complex or for things like that, or you can have a co-op for grocery business where you're an owner, you buy into it, and people buy groceries. You don't see these very much. They're usually developed for, for quite specific activities. They don't really grow. They're more supporting a collective need. Uh, put people into a group so they can share advertising. Or um, One of the first jobs that I interviewed for years ago was a cooperative that did, that did common marketing and development uh, for various kinds of products that were uh, farm type products that they like milk and, uh, and different kinds of meats and stuff like that. Well, they were small farmers that were all working together. And that's how I learned about cooperatives, because I just got called in for an interview. So I talked to them and learned about that and, and didn't pursue it. But that, that is something that is also a useful kind of an effort. Crafts people might band together, that sort of thing. All right. Again, you don't see those too often, but they are out there. So you might see them, and now you'll see what that is. Um, Notice I didn't even mention sole proprietorship here, um, because actually the, the intent is to, to some degree to discourage that, because you should probably protect yourself from liability. This is an important notion to keep in mind in the business environment. As a consumer, you're protected by government consumer protection laws. In business, you, the, uh, the assumption that you make legally is that this person is in business, they play by business rules, they, are not, they do not need protection, they need to protect themselves. If you're out there in the business world trying to form a business, sell things or whatever, you're, you have to be aware of what happens. You have to read the fine print, you have to sign the contracts, no one is out there protecting you. Right? So if you make a mistake, you're liable. So sole proprietors, even though the risk might be low, by and large, any sole proprietor structure carries with it a level of risk that can bring down the financial uh, security of his, his or her family. And so you should try to avoid that. And that's because you, if you're dealing in a consumer environment, the government is out there and they sort of say, hey, that's not fair. This business took advantage of the consumer. You're not taken advantage of as a business person. So if you're running as a sole proprietor, you're running a lawn service as a sole proprietor, and you're not protected, and you're zooming along, and you hit a rock, and that rock goes through somebody's house, and that causes a gas leak, and that gas leak blows up the house, you personally are liable for that for the rest of your life. In other words, if you have, you could have a judgment against your salary to help pay for all these things. Uh, it's very unlikely, but it's a risk that you do not have to take if you form a limited liability company, okay? A limited liability or a corporation or whatever. Sole proprietorship's still out there. They work, you know, in a little a flower shop or whatever. That's all fine. But you have to keep in mind you have risk. You buy insurance, but if the insurance doesn't cover it, you, anything over that, you personally have risk. If it's an LLC, you do not. Sounds an easy, like an easy decision, 500 bucks or whatever to set it up and the ongoing, ex, the ongoing expenses to protect you and, and you're cool, all right? Different kinds of mergers that occur, companies come together. Horizontal merger means that two companies that are both out there, like right now in the news, we have Comcast buying Time Warner. They are both cable companies. They merge and they're horizontal. They just have a broader delivery uh, they'll be in 40 of the metro areas or something like that, 40 of the top 45 metro areas, and almost no overlap. So horizontally, they simply become a bigger company that does the same thing, broader. Vertical merger would be if that same, if Time Warner decided that they were going to buy uh, one of the movie studios that produced the movies or the television studios, like they buy CBS or they buy Universal NBC, so they own all that content. That's a vertical merger. You're buying back in the value chain into the supplier chain. And then conglomerate merger means that you're simply buying companies in a portfolio. They don't necessarily fit together in some way. Uh, you're essentially buying, instead of buying stocks you know, in a portfolio, you buy some Apple and you buy some Dell and you buy some uh, Exxon you know, and you put them in your portfolio. Instead of doing that, you buy the company Apple and you buy the company Dell. You know, and you put those in your portfolio. That's the 
the uh, conglomerate merger idea. Um, and there's some reasons to do that, but there's also some arguments against it because you add a lot of you add some overhead that's not necessary in the the case of a conglomerate. So when you hear about companies buying each other, it's usually one of these three things. There are other possibilities, but it's usually one of these three things. Um, as a digression, Google bought Motorola's cell phone business a while a number of years ago, and then they recently sold off pieces of it back to um, to the the Chinese uh, computer company Lenovo. But they got the intellectual property, they, they, all the patents and everything that Motorola had for their cell phones, their Razor and all that, Google now owns because they bought it for the assets associated with it. That's another possibility. It's kind of like a vertical merger, but not quite. It's different. So that happens as well. But by and large, these are the sorts of things that happen in the marketplace. And notice these are C-Corps because they exist on their own. You can buy and sell them. You can't do that with, um, with LLCs, and you can't do that with... Um, with sole proprietorships, but you can do that with corporations. You buy them and sell them. They're as if they're standard entities. They merge together. They go. They have a life of their own. They can outlive their owner. They can outlive their finer, found, founders. Right? That's what was so cool about that invention when it was uh, when corporations were invented, um, all the way back to the uh, to the India. Um, the uh, one of those uh, companies that would go on trips, uh, the India Tea Company. This is back in the, uh, seventh, the 17th century that would go and bring tea back to England. Um, and of course, there were problems because the tri trips were so long. They needed something that whenever it came back, if the owner had died, his heirs or someone else should have, have access to that material. So they needed something that outlived people. And that's where they came up with this, uh, this idea. So that's the, um, the important value associated with, um, with, these, uh, with having this corporate entity. It allows this capitalist world of large enterprises and small enterprises that we live in um, to prosper. A couple things that are to be aware of in these this sort of arena is we have acquisitions when you buy a company like I say Comcast is buying Time Warner. Um, happens on various times. Uh, there are other things like a corporate raider that you might have heard of. That's someone who comes in and an individual that has access to a lot of cash, not necessarily their own, but cash they kind of have the support of other people with lots of money, come in and make an, uh, an offer for a company to buy, the, um, to buy the company, the whole share. It's called a tender offer. Um, People put in place this thing called a poison pill, which means if somebody makes an offer to a company, there's an automatically a payment that's made to management or to shareholders that, that make it less attractive to make an offer. Um, and the same thing is this, this shark repellent is that um, there has to be a, a large, uh, there has to be a super majority of shareholders to allow for a takeover or whatever. Um, and then a white knight is the term for. This is funny how it's this all this uh, uh, all these colorful names. But if you have someone that comes in as a corporate raider, one name that you might hear is Carl Icahn. He's known for this. He buys up. He comes in and says he wants to buy a company that drives the stock price up. A white knight then comes in and buys the company in in favor of the existing shareholders, the existing management. And that person then becomes the person they sell the company to. But at a higher price, so the corporate raider makes a lot of money on the shares they already own. We could talk about this stuff forever. I actually worked on these kinds of things for a number of years. But these are the sort of things that are happening in the marketplace. And when you hear about them, um, they're interesting to explore and to, uh, and to study just a little bit. A lot of these are bought or are, in, are enabled by this idea of a leverage buyout which, believe it or not, means that you can buy a large company by borrowing money. That's what the leverage means. You go in and you go with a bunch of banks that you get together with, a whole bunch of banks, and they provide you with the funds, and you have a down payment, and it's like buying a house. You have the down payment, and the banks give you a mortgage, but in this case, they give you the money that you use to go and buy a company and is the term is generally referred to, doesn't have to be, but generally referred to as taking the company private. You go to a public company like uh, 
Uh, Michael Dell recently worked a deal like this to buy back his company, Dell Computers. By him personally, he had a lot of shares already. He brought in other people that had shares, but that could not possibly cover the over the total cost of buying all of the shares of Dell. So he brought in other investors and bankers that would provide the money. You go in and buy the company, um, having to pay back much of that debt. So you use the money that is generated by the company in its operations and cash flows to pay the bank back the interest that you purchased, that you bought. And that's the notion of a leverage buyout. Anyone that's interested in these things, we could talk about them more. But it's one of those things that keeps companies efficient because people that see this value being wasted in a company, someone can come in, buy it, restructure it, make enough money to pay for all the money you borrowed and still make a profit when selling the company. And that's what the notion of leverage buyouts are all about. Okay? So next time we'll talk, we'll go on and start talking about how entrepreneurship and franchising and all of that fits into this uh, objective or these objectives. But uh, that's the kind of like the baseline for the kinds of companies you face, how they, uh, your kinds of companies that you might find, kinds of companies you might want to form, what some of the differences and, um, and values of them are. So is there any questions on that this morning? Any questions on anything we covered? You can raise your hand. You can ask a question. All right. I don't see any questions. So in, and just to remind you, we do have the debate starting Monday. But as we said at the very beginning of the discussion, there is also a storm that's supposed to come this weekend. So if school is closed, we can, um, if, the, if the campus is closed on Monday, uh, well, let me ask you this question, those of you that are here. If the campus is closed, would you rather still have our class online like this, a continuation of this discussion, so that we don't have to make up the class later? Would you raise your hand if you'd prefer that we have this online on Monday if, it's, if the school is closed, and that way we don't have to make up the class? I don't see too many, actually. I was open for more. Um, I can't say that vote is a winner. So there's too many people that did not vote for that. I'll give you one more chance. Who would, who would want to have, if, if we have a snowstorm Monday and Adelphi is closed, we still have our class so we don't have to make it up. We still have our class via this method. All right. I hate to say it. Not enough of us. One of you will have to tell me why that's the case when we meet. Um, so put your hands down. All right. So we will not, if, there is a, if Adelphi is closed, we will not have class on Monday. Um, but if Adelphi is open, but I can't make it, we will have class, and we'll do it this way, uh, online. Um, but otherwise, we'll all meet at 11 o'clock on Monday morning, ready to go for our discussion. Okay? Um, and then we can talk. I'd like to talk about this question again, because it looks like we may be having a few more storms before this is all over. And some people may not have actually listened to my question, and maybe we have a we would have more consensus to continue to have our discussions or to have class even if the uh, campus is closed. But all right, so that's the plan. If Adelphi is closed, no class. If Adelphi is open, then come to class unless you hear an email from me which says I can make it because the roads are too bad, in which case we will have online class on Monday and continue this discussion with the small business and enterprise uh, and entrepreneurship discussion. Okay. All right, have a great weekend, everybody. If you have any questions or you want to have any discussion after this class on any of the topics I discussed or anything else, um, I'll be